We're all shopping for essentials online these days, and now you can get rewarded for it. With the Bank of America Customized Cash Rewards credit card, you can choose to earn 3% cash back on online shopping. The essentials have never felt more rewarding. Visit bankofamerica.com slash more rewarding to apply now. Copyright 2021, Bank of America Corporation. Hey everybody, it's Dan and this is our Wednesday edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Mary Kay Cabin and I are going to recap what happened today in Berea and we really focus on some of the news that came out before the Browns hit the practice field like Baker Mayfield not starting in the preseason opener in Jacksonville. Some guys that are hurt and the Browns might want to get back on the field soon to, to really start getting ready for Kansas City and also Kevin Stefanski calling the plays. Oh, and we talk a little bit about Wyatt Teller at the end as well. Now, if you're not a Football Insider subscriber, you've got to get signed up. It's cleveland.com slash browns, the blue banner at the top of the page to become a tech subscriber. Get in, get a daily newsletter delivered to your inbox every single day, which is what the word daily means, and access to those exclusive stories at cleveland.com slash browns. All right, here we go. Our Wednesday Orange Brown Talk podcast. And here we go on our Wednesday recap of Brown's training camp. And we are not going to focus too much on practice today because there was plenty to talk about that happened before practice. And the first thing is uh, Baker Mayfield will not start in Jacksonville in the Brown's preseason opener. It's going to be Case Keenum getting the start. Kyle Aletta uh, obviously going to play as well. Now, I, I guess it's not really like earth shattering news, Mary Kay, that Baker Mayfield is not going to start. But it does give us an idea of something that Kevin Stefanski has been pretty coy about how he's going to approach this this preseason. Yeah, and you know, we weren't really sure until today how they were going to go about it because, you know, some coaches will throw the starters out there for just a series or two, get their feet a little bit wet and, you know, just kind of maybe get, you know, just shake off the rust, feel the pads, maybe, you know, maybe get some contact a little bit for the first time since the end of last season. So, uh, you know, now we know. No Baker Mayfield. He's not going to play at all. Case Keenum starting. uh, I think it's a good move. I really do. I don't think the starters need to be involved in this game. I think you will see very, very few starters play. Uh, I think you're mostly going to see the backups. And I actually think it's a good strategy. They don't need this. They found out last year that they really don't need to actually play in the preseason to have a successful year. Uh, So right now, the goal for this team is to get to that Kansas City game as healthy as possible. And this is one way to try to do that. Yeah, and and we'll get to that. I mean, they're having trouble doing that right now. So we'll we'll certainly get to the injuries they're dealing with. But yeah, I mean, especially with a 17-game schedule and any more in the NFL, it's just so much about that that first month of the season is kind of getting your sea legs and getting things figured out. And it really gets going in October and November. And then the playoff chase is pretty much Thanksgiving on. So there's a pretty clear rhythm to the NFL calendar, as much as the league wants to say every game matters. There's some wiggle room here and there. And I just remember back in 2019, when everybody was so excited about this team, Baker Mayfield led the starting offense on this great touchdown drive to open the season or open the preseason. And it ended up meaning nothing. So, yeah, I mean, to me, health is the priority. And, you know, it's, it's not playing it overly safe. It's just being smart about it. You want these guys week one, not preseason week one. Absolutely. 100%. And we already knew that there were, as you mentioned, a number of guys injured. So uh, even heading into this game, you know, we knew that you, we weren't going to see Odell Beckham Jr. Play in this game. Dave Njoku returned to practice today, but he's been banged up on the offensive side of the ball. On the defensive side of the ball, there are a ton of injuries right now. So this just was not a game conducive to throwing a bunch of starters out there and, you know, letting them get their feet wet. So, uh, you know, I like the approach. Part of it could be the fact that they are so banged up and, you know, that the strategy may have changed as they moved along, but it just doesn't make sense right now. I mean, we've, we've talked to over the years, you know, you and I have talked to Odell Beckham Jr. He never wants to play in another preseason game. And I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't play in any of these three. Um, I'm sure there'll be a time where maybe they'll throw Baker out there for a couple of series here and there. But 
it's not like the olden days where they would throw guys out there for the dress rehearsal game and have them play three quarters of a football game. It's just not worth the injury risk. Yeah. So I, I'm going to throw some names out here as we kind of go through, and I'm curious what you think, if maybe certain guys maybe should play, if you'd like to see them play. So we're going to skip kind of the, the biggest names, obviously, but I guess I'm thinking on the offensive line for those five guys, probably good to go. Would it be beneficial at all to a guy like Jedrick Wills to be out there? You know what? I, I don't know if it would be if the rest of his guys are not there with him. You know, I think that, you know, as we all know and talk about all the time, an offensive line, you know, they have to work together in sync. I, I don't know if it would be that useful to throw him out there if, if he were, you know, just kind of out there by himself. He's getting really good work in training camp, better work against Miles oh. Garrett and Jadavian Clowney than he's going to get in any preseason game this whole entire season. So for that reason, I would keep him out too because he's getting battle tested every single day in practice. Uh, on the defensive side, I'm trying to think. So you're probably not going to play any of the D linemen, at least the starters. In the linebacking core, I mean, this is probably where we would definitely see an Owusu Koromoa. Um, so, so it'll really, I guess the defensive side is where it gets interesting because you almost have to play the rookies at least a little bit. JOK, Greg Newsome, uh, you know, got, you, you'd almost have to get those guys out on the field. Yeah, I think so. I could see those guys playing some. Plus, on the defensive side of the ball, there are so many guys banged up and injured that you're going to have to play somebody. Somebody's going to have to go out there <laughs> and, and, get through, and get through this game. Uh, so, yeah, I can imagine uh, that they will throw Greg out there a little bit, as you mentioned, JOK. Now, the thing with JOK is they, they're still sort of ramping him up. Uh, because he missed the whole entire first five days of training camp, it still seems like he's working his way back in. Now, part of that is the fact that Mac Wilson is now is currently the starting weak side linebacker. So, you know, those backup reps can be hard to come by sometimes. So we haven't seen a ton of JOK, but yeah, this is a game where uh, he might have an opportunity to kind of get his feet wet a little bit. Um, Trevor Lawrence probably won't play either. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't I know. Can, I know we, we don't really know that yet but um but yeah I would imagine that you're going to see a ton of backups so the point is you know if you were going to tune in to try to see Jadavian Clowney and Odell Beckham Jr. and Baker Mayfield this is not the night for that I'm, uh, I'm going to search around and see if we've gotten any news on Trevor Lawrence it wouldn't surprise me because he's a rookie uh, if he started but I don't I don't see any updates as of right now as to whether he's actually going to play or not on Saturday um, Mac Wilson, you brought him up and I think that's an interesting name. I mean, is that a guy that maybe you look at and say, I kind of want to see what he can do in, in a football game, even if it is just a preseason game. You know what? I mean, I suppose so, but if he's considered to be a starter right now, right. um, uh, and they're not going to be playing the starters, then they won't play him. They, they won't play him. If they are starting with their, uh, second team guys, then Mac's not going to be out there. You're going to see JOK out there. Um, and that, that spot actually is a spot that has been uh, a little challenged because you have Mac and he's been doing really well. Then you have JOK and he missed all that time. And you've got Tony Fields, who is not going to be back anytime soon. And he plays weak side linebacker as well. So uh, it's, it's been a position where you haven't been able to roll guys through there the way they wanted to. Okay, that's enough preseason talk. <laughs> Let's talk Kevin Stefanski. He confirmed today that he was going to call plays this year. Uh, you, you know, there was maybe some suspicion that he might let Alex Van Pelt call plays. I, I know you've thrown out that possibility at times here on this podcast, and it, it certainly wouldn't surprise me if, if he made that choice. Uh, he did say the other day that he's going to let some of his assistants do it in the preseason to kind of let them get their feet wet and get those reps. But uh, when, when the lights go on for real, it's going to be him calling the plays. And, and you laid out some reasons as to why, that's the right decision. So uh, what's your thinking there? Yeah, I wrote a column about this because I really do think uh, that it is the right choice for him to continue to do it. One of the major reasons I feel that way is because, uh, you know, he is just now starting to put his own stamp on this offense. Okay. Last year, he had to come in and do what was going to work for him. And that was to run the Gary Kubiak offense that he called the year before in Minnesota. 
He didn't have time to reinvent the wheel. He didn't have time to incorporate new thoughts, new ideas, new things from, you know, from Alex Van Pelt, Chad O'Shea, Bill Callahan, Stump Mitchell, and Drew Petzing and all those guys. He really didn't have time to do that. He just had to hit the ground running with what he knew was going to work. Well, that's not who he is. I've been saying this for, for a long time on this podcast. We cannot paint Kevin Stefanski into the Gary Kubiak corner. Do not do it because you will, uh, you will be mad at yourself when you find out that that's not who he is. He has had so many offensive influences in his career. He's had some good defensive influences too, including a Leslie Frazier, Mike Zimmer, whatnot. But um, just from an offensive standpoint, starting back with you know Brad Childress, and then moving on to a number of other guys, uh, ending up with a, you know a North Turner, Pat Shermer. He's got a lot in his arsenal, and he could possibly be. I made the point that I mean, you never know. He's so young; he's only called thirty-five games. He could be a creative play caller in the mold of an Andy Reid, and you just don't know. So you don't want to give that up uh, before you actually find out at some point in your career that you don't want to do it anymore. And maybe that'll be never, but it certainly shouldn't be now. And it doesn't mean that Alex Van Pelt is not capable because he is. I think Alex Van Pelt is head coach material someday. I really do. Just in talking to him, in seeing him coach, in hearing people talk about him, he feels like head coach material to me. But I think Kevin's doing the right thing. They collaborate on it anyways. And Alex Van Pelt can get sort of the, um, you know, the practice and the experience doing it by collaborating like that. And if he's good enough, and I think he is, they'll find him. Teams will find him, even if he's not the number one play caller. Now, I want to go back to what Kevin said the other day uh, about letting his assistants call plays. And that, look, that's not reinventing the wheel. I made a bad joke on Twitter about how this could end up with John Dorsey hiring the next guy to be his, his next head coach or something. <laughs> but I do like that Kevin is doing this, right? I, I mean, we, we all do remember, all jokes aside, Todd Haley let Freddie Kitchens do it. Freddie Kitchens ended up being the offensive coordinator halfway through that season. So it's, it's not something new, but... I do think it's an important thing to know because the reality is this is a good football team. If you're really good, you're going to lose coaches like Alex Van Pelt can go be a head coach someday. You know, Malik Jackson, when I talked to him back in June, I think it was said he wants to help Joe Woods become a head coach. He wants his defense to be really good and help Joe Woods become a head coach. Like that's a good thing. That means your team is really good. And I think Kevin Stefanski understands that like, okay, I've got to have the next guy ready to go, whether that's, a Drew Petzing or somebody else on his staff. I've got to have that next guy ready to go. So that if I say to him, Hey, I want you to be my OC, he's at least worn that headset and called the plays before. So I, I actually think again, all jokes aside, I do think this is a good forward thinking approach by Kevin Stefanski who understands that with success comes turnover, but it's the good kind of turnover. Yes, absolutely. 100%. You're very, very right about that. And the, the number one coach that I've seen do this starting way back from when I covered him in Cleveland was Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick always has a couple of guys waiting in the wings to step into that job. And he lost coach after coach after coach over the years. And he just had, it was really the next man up mentality on the coaching staff with Bill Belichick. And they never, ever, they never missed a beat. And those coaches are so good. That's why I always uh, sing the praises of Chad O'Shea because he comes from that new England Patriots system where they just really develop those coaches and get them ready to go uh, when their time comes. So, um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is that people groomed Kevin Stefanski along the way to continue to move up. It was a coach development program that he was on and, and he wants to do that for his coaches and he's going to bring them along. We've heard him say, even with the Callie Brownson that, you know, she has head coach potential and he's going to do whatever it takes uh, to let her try out, you know, you know, coach, she's coaching the running backs right now. She was coaching the receivers at one, at one point last year. Uh, But it's, it's just that whole, whole coach development thing. And uh, he knows how to reach back and pull other people up because that was what was done for him. So that that's the uh, corollary to it. Right. And the other thing too, it's not just coordinator to head coach. It's, you know, it's, it's guys who going from position coach to coordinator, even someplace else. And again, fans don't want to see people leave, but 
that that's actually a good thing because coaches are going to understand, Hey, if I go work for Kevin Stefanski, I can get it. I can get that job. I've been wanting forever. So you're going to continue to bring in young talent. You're going to be able to continue to bring in guys who want to work for you and want to be a part of, of what you're doing. If you're showing Hey, you come to Cleveland, I'm going to turn you into coordinator. I'm going to turn you into a head coach. You're, you're going to get that, that job and that paycheck that you got into this business for. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And I think the thing, uh, that, that he may have grappled with a little bit was whether or not he should let Alex do it so he could really help get him in that pipeline and get people thinking about him as a head coaching candidate. But as I mentioned before, if you're good enough at your job, Vince, there is a, a route or a path by which uh, you can do that. But that may have been, you know, one of the things that, that Kevin thought about was, you know, should he try a little harder to help Alex move ahead in his career and sort of give back in that way. Um, but I, I don't, I think Alex is good enough that, uh, that people will come and find him if, if they have a great year this year. And I, I mentioned this in my column, uh, Aaron Rodgers has praised Alex Van Pelt. And, you know, if you've got that on your resume and then you turned to help turn around the career of Baker Mayfield and picked him up off the mat, and got him playing the way that you did last year, people are going to notice that. And they're going to come and find that because they're going to want some of that for themselves. I was just kind of looking around a little bit too. I, like Sean McVay is doing it this year. He's letting somebody else call the plays in, in the preseason. So, um, you know, this is something that, that forward thinking coaches are, are going to do. Hey, it's Dan. And before we get back to the podcast, let me tell you about our virtual Orange and Brown season kickoff event taking place on Wednesday, September 1st, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. You can join Mary Kay Cabot, Scott Patsko, Ellis Williams, Doug Maurice, Terry Pluto, and me. We'll have in-depth discussions on the team, analysis, a live auction, and even some surprise cameos. Tickets for the event are free, and they can be reserved through the link in the bio of this podcast, or the description of this podcast, I should say. There's also a VIP experience. Enter for a chance to win tickets to a special smaller group VIP experience with Browns alumni players and Cleveland.com sports writers. There's only 150 tickets available for this special experience. So to enter the ticket sweepstakes, again, go to that link in the description of this podcast to enter. Again, that's our Orange and Brown virtual season kickoff event on Wednesday, September 1st from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Okay, let's talk about those injuries that I mentioned earlier. And look, it's really piling up over there on those bikes. Uh, guys are, are out with hamstring injuries all over the place. A uh, few guys just haven't been at practice. Denzel Ward is dealing with soreness. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's just so much on the injury front going around. But I guess today the most interesting thing on that front was Grant Delpit. And we heard from Jeff Howard. He's the DB's coach. And he just came out and said that Grant Delpit has participated in something like nine team reps this camp. And it, it's starting to get – time's starting to get short, Mary Kay. As again, again, I believe that's something you wrote today, that, that time is starting to get short for Grant Delpit here. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. So I discovered, and I wrote this for Sunday, that he wasn't just dealing with the Achilles. I noticed that he had been standing over there in the bucket hat for like three or four days straight. And so I did a little bit of digging and found that this wasn't just the regular Achilles protocol that he had been on, where they actually did have him on a pretty strict pitch count. Uh, this turned out to be something different. And what it was, was a hamstring injury. So while he's trying to, to ramp up and get in some team drills uh, coming off the Achilles, uh, he pulls a hamstring or tweaks a hamstring, and he's been out for a significant amount of time now. I can't remember when I first started noticing the sequence of like three, four days in a row. Uh, but it's been, a, I think it's been over a week now that he's been out with the hamstring. And this is a significant setback for Grant, because as you just mentioned, Jeff Howard told us that he, he has played a total of nine team reps. Okay. The season opener is one month away, nine team reps coming off of a torn Achilles. I, I would find it absolutely shocking if he can get ready to play in the opener uh you know like i said he was still in a ramp up phase coming off the achilles this is a setback and it's something that they're going to have to adjust to but makes it what makes it really tricky dan is the fact that his 
you know, replacement, basically, Ronnie Harrison Jr., the guy who was slated to start opposite John Johnson, and I think still is slated to start opposite John Johnson, has been out since, I think, I looked back today. July, July 30th. July 30th. He, yeah. he left practice. He left practice on July 30th. Yeah, he left practice on July 30th. He's been out since July 30th with his, that means he practiced two days, two full days, and then some of the 30th. Uh, so he, you know, that is absolutely not the way that you expected that to go. So the, the safety, the second safety spot opposite John Johnson has taken a hit. And who have we seen in there? Javante Moffitt, okay? And the rookie, Richard LeCount. Richard LeCount is not ready uh, to, to play NFL football yet. I mean, he, you know, he, he's, he's a fifth round pick. He's got potential, but you're, you can't throw him out there uh, against the Kansas City Chiefs, in my opinion. He's coming up the learning curve, doing a nice job, but, you know, that's just not, that wasn't going to be part of the plan. So they need Ronnie Harrison Jr. to get back as fast as he possibly can. But it's tricky, Dan. I mean, these hamstrings, and we'll talk about that after we talk about the safety position specifically. Uh, but you have to take your time with those hamstrings because if you try to rush that back, you could be out for two months. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just, just to note, MJ Stewart was getting some work at safety today. So they're, they're trying some things out there as, as they kind of sneak down that depth chart a little bit. Miles Garrett, of course, dealing with the hamstring. We talked about him yesterday. I'll say it again. I'm not super concerned. I think if, as long as he's good to go week one, he's fine. The guy that I'm getting worried about, though, Mary Kay, is Anthony Schwartz. Mm -hmm. Because he missed a lot of spring and we have not seen him much in training camp either. I think he it was very early in training camp that he popped up on those bikes and we haven't seen him in practice since. Yeah, you know what? It, it was unfortunate because we watched him in in rookie camp and he struggled a little bit with the hands and then he suffered the hamstring pull and he missed most of the rest of spring. Then he worked, you know, and he had been working hard with with Jarvis down at House of Athlete and, and really trying to work on those hands, and make progress. He did make progress when he came back for training camp. He practiced a couple of days. And as as we have been saying on this podcast, if you don't let a torn hamstring or a pulled hamstring or whatever you want to call it fully heal, it's going to come back and bite you. It's going to nag you and it could linger on and you could re-injure it. And that's what's happened with him. He's really, really struggling. And when you have an injured hamstring and you're a speedster, well, you know, obviously you've just taken away his biggest strength, which is his speed. So, uh, so this is, this is unfortunate for him because I'm telling you what, they were excited to try to put in a package of plays for him as early as they could to utilize that speed, to get it on the field and to get defensive coordinators thinking about that speed. And now he's another one where I just don't see how you could have him ready to, to do very much in that Kansas city game. And, and, you know, you got to be careful with it. And I actually thought he got off to a decent start here in camp too. Um, mm -hmm. I, I thought he did a nice job. So one other thing I want to talk about is Wyatt Teller. Uh, he talked to us as a group today. I had a chance to talk to him last week and wrote a story about it. And when I talked to him, I got this sense and I got this sense again today I, I'm not saying he's gone. I'm not saying he's got a foot out the door. I think it's way too early to say that, but I'm saying, I think he has an understanding that there just might not be the money he wants here. That, that's the impression I got listening to him last week when I talked to him and listening to him today. He wants to be here, but if somebody out there is going to give him $14 million, I don't know that it's going to be here. And I feel like he has a pretty good understanding of that. Yeah, here's the thing. As you mentioned, you did um, you did ask him about that last week when you did that really nice interview with him, which there's a story on that and a whole podcast on that. So that was a really nice job by you. Um, but we got him going on that again a little bit today. And I asked him point blank, you know, is the siren call of free agency too loud and too powerful uh, to turn your back on that? I mean, these guys wait all their careers to get to free agency to be able to grab that brass ring and hit that jackpot. And, and he's there. It's, I mean, he can taste it. He can feel it. I mean, it is right there in front of him. And I don't think he's in, he's one of those guys that is in the situation where you really almost would be doing yourself a disservice 
if you did not test the market. And I have compared it quite often to the Jack Conklin situation. Really good football player, obviously, all pro football player. And, um, you know, the Titans just couldn't afford to keep him. I mean, he was going to, uh, they knew that what he could get on the open market was more than what they were willing to pay him. And when you look at the salary structure of the Cleveland Browns, as Wyatt Teller mentioned, you can't pay everybody. They've got a lot of good football players. You can't pay everybody. And he, he basically said today, I want to get paid. I want to maximize my earning potential. I've got maybe one chance to get it right this, this time. This is the one time that he probably will uh, be able to make multi, multi millions on a, on a big, big contract like this. And, you know, you just don't want to sell yourself short. If you, if you take too quick a bite at the apple in this situation, you could be leaving a lot of millions on the table. And when, again, when you look at the salary structure of the Cleveland Browns, here's the thing. They don't even consider him to be, in my opinion, the best guard on the football team, right? I mean, who's the best guard on the football team, Dan? I mean, it's, it's Joel Batonio. The, yeah, so Joel Batonio is the best guard. He makes something like $9 million a year. So if you had to pay Wyatt Teller what he can get on the open market, you're going to end up paying him, I don't know what the market value is right now, but it's something like, it would be something like $14 million or something. Well, so, so just $14 million right now is about the top end. Brandon Scherf is playing on the franchise tag, so he's making $18 million. This is all on over the cap, and guys, they have his right guards. Brandon Brooks is 14 Zach Martin is 14 Graham Glasgow signed in 2019 for $11 million. Uh, and then you do start getting down under $10 million, but I, his number is going to come in, I would imagine, somewhere. It has to be like 10 or 11 I, I would I would guess. Yeah, and it'll probably be more than that because um, because he'll probably have another really good season on a really good football team where he's surrounded by also a lot of talent, and he's got really good, really good running backs running behind him, and he's got a good quarterback, so uh, he's he's going to have another good season, and he's going to add to that resume and that paycheck, and so he could be one of those guys where you know you just let him get get to free agency. And hey, if you decide to to match whatever else he can get, so be it. But if you don't, you you don't do it with the realization that you're paying Jack Conklin, you're paying Joel Batonio, you're paying Jed Wills, you're gonna you're gonna pay Jed Wills more. Uh, so, uh, so this is one of those situations like a Jack Conklin where uh, all parties involved might just decide, you know what? Let's let's let his price get set on the open market and then we go from there that that's what I I mean I'm sure they're talking I'm sure they've talked to his agent and they've they've had these discussions but it just seems to me that that's would make the most sense that's what I would do I, I would not I would not sell myself short in this situation I wouldn't either and and look it's not like he was a high draft pick you know he was a fifth round pick I believe so, you know, he's, he's going to want to make some money and, and rightfully so if he earns it, you know, good, good for him. I, I'm looking this up now. So he, um, when he signed, it was a four-year deal worth $2.7 million as a, uh, as a, the 166th pick in the draft. So, you know, he's, he's got a chance to certainly increase that in a big way here in, in, in this coming off season. And listen, maybe, maybe the Browns do franchise him. And give him 18 million for one year. I doubt it, but you know, maybe they make that decision and that's a good outcome for him too. Yeah. I mean, it would be a good outcome for him. As you mentioned, you doubt it. And I kind of doubt it too, because once again, I just don't know that they're going to want to have a guard making $18 million a year, which the franchise tag for an offensive lineman doesn't differentiate between guard and tackle. So the guards are going to make the big, big money too on the franchise tag. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I just don't see them necessarily doing that. I think they would probably rather develop a younger guard because you're going to have to save some pennies somewhere, you know, I mean, you can't pay everybody double digit millions and they're going to have their big paydays coming up pretty soon. You're actually going to have to start paying the, the big cap numbers, uh, to, you know, to miles and to Denzel and to Baker and to Nick. And, um, so yeah, this is one where, I think we've thought this all along that if they had to let one kind of test the market and test the waters, it would be him. 
Okay. I think we covered everything here today uh, from Berea. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. We will be back on Thursday uh, recapping everything that happens in Berea on day 13 of training camp, I believe it is. So Mary Kay, I will talk to you then. Sounds good. It's preseason. Take football further with NFL Game Pass. We make plays and we dominate all night long. Catch every rookie debut with live out of market preseason games. Welcome to the NFL. See big names in their new homes. And here comes one. Julio Jones, touchdown. Plus, get all the action in 45 minutes or less with condensed game replays. Oh, my goodness. Take football further with NFL Game Pass. Go to NFL.com slash Game Pass to start your free trial today. You're ready to get back into yoga, so you order the essentials, a non-slip mat, yoga blocks to keep balance, and an exercise ball. And you use your Bank of America customized cash rewards credit card, choosing to earn 3% cash back on online shopping and up to 5.25% as a preferred rewards member, which you put towards your most essential yoga gear, noise-canceling headphones. Apply for yours at bankofamerica.com slash more rewarding. Copyright 2021 Bank of America Corporation.